Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Surge Podcast. So uh, for today, I wanted to start uh, talking about another part of my practice that I rarely talk about because it kind of scares my colleagues a little bit. Um, I'm involved as a medical expert sometimes for certain legal cases. And, you know, it's something that I find quite interesting because it, it, it sort of tells me how, how the system's designed, let's say and how things can go wrong sometimes. And today I wanted to talk about the do's and don'ts of discharging patients against medical advice. And the reason why is because, um, you know, there are hypothetical scenarios that come up. And so let's talk about uh, one. So you have a patient who has been diagnosed with a condition um, that seems to be pretty bad. They have multiple comorbidities, and now they have this acute condition that requires intubation. Let's say that they have... Um, pancreatitis that has led to a hemodynamic instability and an ARDS-like picture. And this patient uh, has a background history of schizophrenia or alcoholism and um, drug use, um, self-prescribed drug use. And when it comes down to intubating the patient, the patient decides that they don't want to be intubated and that they want to leave the hospital and the reasons that they cite are the fact that they just want to leave. You rightfully so respect the patient's autonomy, and you decide that this patient is allowed to leave. But then you bring the AMA form, and you get the patient to sign it. And the patient signs that AMA form, the Against Medical Advice form. And that form is basically something that I think very few doctors or nurses or other healthcare specialists, such as nurse practitioners, physician's assistants, anybody who's authorized to read that form rarely understands it completely. The only thing that we, we sort of think about, or the only thing that we're taught back in medical school, is uh, get the patient to sign it, basically, if they're coherent and if they look okay to you. And the main reason why we get people to sign that form is because there's an impression that we're protected, right? If they sign that form, that means that you're not going to get sued. That means that nothing's going to happen. Ultimately, at that point, when your patient is refusing medical care, that's what you think. But is that your reality? Well, for one thing, having practiced in more than one place uh, over the past couple of years, I can tell you that in certain countries, patients may not have the right to refuse if they may die. In certain countries, if your patient has a risk of death, and I'm not talking a remote risk of death, I mean an absolute risk of death, like our pancreatitis patient, they don't really have the right to refuse intubation. They don't really have the right to refuse care. So that's one aspect that, that you need to have down if you're going to be using that form. You need to decide whether or not that form is actually legally protected in the country that you're practicing in. The other thing that you need to think about is why you're ultimately making him sign that form and why the patient is leaving. And I'll explain why in a second. If that patient were to be allowed to leave, and they are at a point where they have pancreatitis to the extent that it's, it's, it, basically they're, in, they're not breathing anymore, they're in multi-organ failure, what are the chances that you are actually doing the right thing. And by the right thing, I mean the right thing to do as a physician or as a healthcare worker. What are the chances that you're actually doing that in your head? Think about it. Ultimately, your job is not to be a lawyer. Ultimately, your job is not to protect the institution. Your job is to advocate for your patient. And yes, the patient does have autonomy, but the word autonomy is a very gray area in the legal sense. We like to think that it's clear-cut, but as you'll see, it may not be. So if you're going to study anything as a physician, not as a lawyer, you want to talk about risk factors. Risk factors for AMA and pretending that AMA is a disease may sound like a reasonable thing, but when you look at all the data, every country and every region has something completely different. This paper's out of um, Hopkins, and they go through the risk factors and the traits that they see. In 
a fair number of cases that they're seeing in their emergency rooms, a psychiatric condition is one of the risk factors, which makes coherence and competence a very big problem. Okay? You don't know if they're going to be competent or not. The male-to-female distribution varies closer to males, typically lower socioeconomic status, typically with no health insurance, no real primary care physician. They're not part of the system, quote-unquote, and a history of substance misuse. And in many cases, they also have some form of abdominal pain, nausea or vomiting, or an alcohol-related disorder, right? Some reasons that they give are personal obligations, others are financial concerns, and some, in some cases, it is dissatisfaction with care. Let's be honest, we don't hit a home run every day, right? You know, as physicians, we all have our bad days. We all sometimes fall short of the expectations of our patients. It's part and parcel of the game, right? And sometimes they feel that they feel better and they just want to go home. And I'm seeing that more and more with certain conditions uh, that uh, are viral related, let's say, just so that this doesn't become a, um, a uh, flagged video situation. Now, that's in the States, right? When we look at other countries like Nigeria, which is where this paper is from, the male to female distribution is pretty much even, around about 50-50, not significant. The number of patients that are being discharged are vastly from medicine as opposed to psychiatry. Psychiatry is not even on the map, right? Um, the percentage of AMAs with an actual form signed goes up to 8%, whereas in the Hopkins paper, it was about 6%. In some papers, it's quoted as up to 35%, actually. And in those places, what seems to be the number one cause is financial constraints. People simply don't want to pay or can't pay, or can't afford to pay. The second problem is lack of confidence in Nigeria, at least from this paper. What seems to be interesting is, unlike in the States, where it's a low socioeconomic condition, what seems to be evident is that in Nigeria, a lot of the time, the patient is of a higher socioeconomic status and would describe themselves as an entrepreneur in some cases. So when you look at this and when you think about it in, in that fashion, it's very hard to extrapolate any conclusion from looking at risk factors unless you're going to look at risk factors within your institution as part of a continuous QR or CQI program, which I think is something that we should think about for AMAs. I think that an AMA can be useful. If there's anything you're going to get out of it when your patient leaves, it's that, you know. Another good paper that you should read if you're interested in this stuff and you're like me and have no life is uh, the David et al. paper here, which I'm going to include in the link in the show notes if I remember to do so. Recognize that based on all of these things and other papers that I've read, you can get sued. You can get sued. Uh, especially if you talk to lawyers, which I've done uh, preparation for this, also because like half my friends are lawyers these days, uh, I can tell you right now that you can get sued. And the AMA form is nothing more than a documentation, you could say, that the plaintiff acknowledges that they're leaving against medical advice. But it, it doesn't mean that you're not going to get sued. And you really have to understand that medical malpractice is becoming its own specialty in law in many places. And it's booming. Right now, I'm in the Middle East. That's where I'm working these days. Um, I do consult in the States and in Canada for medical malpractice issues and uh, things like that. And I also consult here. Um, I do provide consultancy. If you want, you can DM me. I don't mind. Um, I'll include my contacts in the show notes too. I'm not advertising this, but I'm just saying that if you need any advice, I'm around. In the Middle East, I'm seeing a huge boom. And part of it is the way that the laws are designed. And part of it is something else. It's kind of like in the States back in the 90s. And it's still happening a lot in the States. And sometimes these lawsuits are frivolous. And sometimes they're not. Sometimes you genuinely have to pay. This is a high stakes game. Let's be honest. If we fuck up, and if we've led to a significant disability with a patient, we should pay. And that's why malpractice insurance makes sense. But you also have to understand, malpractice insurance is a very much an ivory tower first world thing. In many countries right now, you can't get malpractice insurance. The concept doesn't exist, right? 
you really have to understand you can get sued for anything. And this is just a meme I got off of Reddit. I'm not sure how true it is. But apparently, somebody actually sued somebody for breaking their dentures, on the, which were on the floor, during CPR. It doesn't make sense to me. Lawyers are advertising this day in and day out. In fact, if you look at the numbers, right, it does not make sense what's happening to us as physicians. You have 323 deaths attributed to sporting rifles in the States. But you have 195,000 due to medical malpractice. So theoretically, anything... <laughs> Theoretically, medical malpractice kills more people than guns. Theoretically. Now, I don't think that that's the case, obviously. I think that many of these lawsuits are probably unwarranted, right? But you still can get sued even if you sign an AMA or you get your patient to sign an AMA. And I, ha I can't emphasize this enough. Being found guilty or having uh, the plaintiff or having uh, the case go with the plaintiff is not the worst thing that can happen. The worst thing that can happen is not to have malpractice insurance and to be sued in the first place. And it's not because of the financial concern. It's because how you, of how you feel on the inside. Quite frankly, uh, the guys that I work with here, I keep telling them over and over and over again, all of my colleagues that I work with, again and again and again, to prepare for their first lawsuit. It's going to happen. And when it does happen, be prepared. Acknowledge it psychologically because the psychological burden of being sued is horrible. It's even worse when you're being sued because your patient refused treatment at one point. And so we have to find an approach for against medical advice discharges that makes sense. We have to recognize that rather than looking at risk factors and demographics, a more logical way, albeit less scientific, is to provide a statement of the problem. To sit down and write down what the problem is. You have a patient with a condition that you know how to treat. Your patient doesn't want treatment. You have to ask yourself why. And in most cases, the why leads to perception as the problem. Perception is when two people see the same object, but, or see the same concept, or see the same thing, but they interpret that thing differently. An example would be a nine. A nine seen from one angle looks like a nine. Seen from another angle looks like a six. So if you have two people standing on either side of the nine, one person will call it a six, the other person will call it a nine, they'll get into an argument. That's the vast majority of cases. When I audited our own institution here in, in, in Kuwait, that's the vast majority of cases, okay? The second is fear. Fear of the healthcare system, iatrophobia. Now, iatrophobia, I did a quick review of this. It can be fear of the institution itself. It can be an, an, a perception that the institution is low in quality or the physician is low in quality. It can be the fact that the patient does not feel that the doctors at, or the physicians active, actively trying to treat them or healthcare workers actively trying to treat them. It can be fear of being caught if you're have drugs on you, right? If you have illegal contraband on you, if you have a weapon on you, if you've been shot in the chest. All of these things are being stabbed. All of these things lead to fear. And so that in and of itself is a perception problem. The patient does not recognize the urgency of their condition when compared to their fears. And so we have to learn how to recognize a patient uh, recognize a patient's perception, and then try and change it, which is extremely difficult if you ask anybody who's tried. But we also have to recognize our patient's autonomy. And we have to have a sense of urgency at the same time. And so it, the reality of the situation is, it's not easy. It will never be easy to do. But you have to try. You have to advocate for what you feel is best for your patient while knowing well and good that at the end of the day, you may not be able to provide the patient with the care that you think is appropriate and you may have to let the patient go home. You have to respect that as well. So a couple of hacks and tips that I've learned over the years is to spend five minutes having coffee with a friend who works in a mental health center, preferably an acute mental health center, preferably. These are people with a lot of insight who have seen a lot of people refuse things. 
based on perception problems. Then understand why your patient is refusing therapy. Most of the time, if it's a dissatisfaction situation, the patient will make it very clear very quickly. That, those are the easiest. But if there's another problem, poor social circumstances, kids at home that they have to take care of, other things like that, you may have to start and work on, to work on that as well. So you need to recognize the problem that the patient has and then try and fix it. Help the patient understand by speaking to them as an advocate, not as a friend and not as a physician or a healthcare worker. You are not just, this isn't a job anymore. This has major ramifications to your patient's quality of life. So you cannot, you cannot, you cannot. I will repeat this a fourth time now. You cannot let the patient make a decision without understanding why they're making the decision. You can let them make the decision once you've understood why they're making the decision. And if you can't understand it, then there's a problem. If it's a communication issue or a fear of the actual procedure, let's say, use YouTube. Use other resources online to clarify the procedure. Ultimately, I don't know anything about fixing cars. And so when a mechanic tells me that something needs to be fixed in a way that looks a little bit scary or sounds a little bit off, they're going to have to explain to me why, right? It's the same thing with us as, as healthcare workers. We, we really have to take the time to allow our patients to tell us what their concerns are. And then we have to take the time to make sure that those concerns are addressed. Oftentimes, getting a colleague or a patient's advocate, somebody else to advocate for the patient as a surrogate, to help you out is a good thing. And ultimately, most of the time, people are around to help. You can literally ask your patient if they, can, if they have a friend or a next of kin that can come in to try and explain to them and that type of thing. And most of the time, if you can wait, it's a good thing to do. Now, everybody talks to me about competence, 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 competence. It's not about competence. Competence is more of a legal term these days. I know that the textbooks still use it. I would say that if you're going to have a patient sign AMA, you have to think about their capacity to sign it. So their capacity, I would say the easiest way to define it is to assess their ability to express choice and to communicate it effectively. Their ability to process and understand information, their ability to understand the significance of the information and the consequences of it, and their ability to manipulate the information. The patient should be able to engage in a conversation where they understand the logical process and the decisions. And they have to have full mental capacity, be awake and be oriented, obviously. Now, if all else fails, if all of this stuff fails and your patient is still refusing, the AMA form is just a safety net for the institution. If you look on PubMed right now, there are at least three or four papers on this. Most of them I've quoted. One of them I didn't. Those papers all mention lawsuits. The highest quoted in one region is 55 lawsuits in one institution. In all of those cases, the AMA form was interpreted as a documentation that the plaintiff acknowledges that they left against medical advice. But it does not document anything else. It does not document their capacity at the time. It does not document your capacity at the time. It does not document why the patient left against medical advice. In most cases, it does not document anything to do with capacity nothing to do with capacity. And I would be very interested to see people audit that type of documentation. If you were to ask me about the best practices for AMA, I'd tell you, number one, know the law in your region that you're working in. Know the law. In some countries, you cannot allow a patient to refuse care. If it's, if it's life or death, you cannot allow them to refuse care. You just can't. There are certain countries where you just can't. It's it's, it's not something that's even remotely thought of as being a discussion. You cannot let somebody refuse care because there's an interpretation within the law 
that uh, the refusal of care is tantamount to suicide, which is illegal in, in those countries, right? Um, in some countries, you cannot try and persuade a patient in a different way or to talk to somebody else if they're copus mentis. Patient confidentiality is part of the law, in many countries, in fact. And so having somebody else be a surrogate for the patient or be an advocate for the patient, rather, is probably something that you can't do legally if the patient's going to pursue a lawsuit, right? Number two, check and document capacity and competence. Number three, rewrite a thorough history and physical examination, including investigations that will tell or that will tell the person who's reading it at the time of the lawsuit why you were worried and why you advocated for your treatment. Justify your treatment modality that the patient is refusing. Document the severity of the illness and potential risks. Document the risks, benefits, and alternatives that you have mentioned to the patient and that the patient understood them. Check if the patient will travel. If they will travel, you need to give them special instructions. That's the sin on. It has to be done, right? And still provide care. Give them a prescription for antibiotics, for example, if they need them for an overwhelming infection. Give them the alternative care that they need. And make sure that they know that no matter what happens, the institution is available to them. I'm not talking about violent people. That's a different episode. I'm talking about the ability to provide care should always be available for your patient if you're advocating for them. If you're a healthcare worker that advocates for your patients. If you're not, don't listen to this podcast. What it comes down to is when you're addressing against medical advice discharges, the first thing that goes through your head should be don't discharge the patient. Try your best to advocate for them to stay. Um, thank you for listening. Uh, this is the end of this episode. Um, I do realize that it's been a while. Um, I'm revamping bits and pieces of the, the, the podcast right now. Um, I'd like to thank everybody for their support. Uh, the amount of feedback that I'm getting is tremendous, uh, especially the reviews. I might do an episode just with the feedback and the reviews and things like that. Um, I just want to plug uh, two different uh, companies. Um, I'm not being paid by them or anything. Uh, they're kind of... I'd like to think of them as sponsors spiritually. Uh, Dar Scrubs is a local Kuwaiti company uh, that brings uh, scrubs to Kuwait. Um, Dar basically means uh, room in Arabic, or, or lounge, rather. Uh, the reason why I'm plugging this company is because, as you know, uh, all around the world, um, local businesses are taking a hit with COVID. Um, Dar Scrubs is one of those local businesses. And I really do think that they provide excellent, excellent, excellent service. They literally put the clothes on my back. And the reason why um, I'm advocating for them is because they have timely delivery. And you're going to say, well, you can order stuff from Amazon. Well, we can order everything from Amazon. But when you live in the Middle East, shipping it back because the size is too big or too small is impossible. Whereas if it's a local company like Dar Scrubs, you're more likely to be able to to send it back or return it. Uh, They provide... Um, shipping all across the Middle East, not just Kuwait. And obviously, they have a return policy. You can check it out on their website. Um, I think that they provide a phenomenal service. And I like the fact that it's a personal service too. Um, So I advocate for them. And the music for today's episode was from the amazing DJ Bonita of Vinyl Destination Kuwait. Vinyl Destination Kuwait is the number one specialized vinyl store in the Middle East. Um, I firmly advocate for them uh, for multiple reasons, including the fact that they have a phenomenal collection. Phenomenal collection. If you like good vinyl, go ahead and visit their website. If you're not bored yet and would like to subscribe, these are the barcodes. Um, Thank you for listening, and thank you for the awesome feedback, everyone. Yes, sir.